You're now listening to Wilson King Podcast. This episode of the Wilson King Podcast is brought to you by Bright Live. Contact Bright Live for all your wedding, entertainment, band, and DJ needs. BrightLiveEvents.com, BrightLiveEvents at gmail.com, or visit us on Facebook at Bright Live. What the fuck is up, everybody? Sitting down with Joey Sturgis, founder of Joey Sturgis Tones, founder of URM Academy, and... Oh man, oh man, I'm I'm fucking up. I'm freaking out a little bit. Oh shit. Oh shit. <laughs> Drumforge. <laughs> Drumforge, yeah. And also the mastermind behind like 80% of my favorite fucking albums growing up. That's awesome. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to be here. Dude, thanks for sitting down and chatting with me. Like I'm super stoked. Like the way everything played out, like I've been on like cloud nine since yesterday so (laughs) um but nah man um so a lot of people who know you know that you've done a lot of work with devil wears prada and y'all have a really good relationship together but are there any other is is there another band or bands that like you really 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 loved working with yeah there's a few that come to mind um and they seem to just be from that formidable time period, right? Where like everything was sort of like magically coming together. And that's kind of like the bands like Asking Alexandria, We Came as Romans, Of Mice and Men, um, even like The Color Morale. Like I had such an amazing relationship with almost every single client that I did multiple records for. Um, It didn't really start to get weird until... Like, I guess, you know, the scene started to, like, get more and more successful. And these bands actually started to get kind of big. And then, like, that's when it started to become a thing where it was like, oh, instead of, like, we'll just go to Joey, it would be like, oh, well, maybe Joey can do a song. Or we'll see if Joey wants to mix it, you know. And that that would kind of, because it started to get more competitive. There were more guys out there. Uh, People had bigger budgets. They were able to have access to, uh, you know, bigger producers, things like that. So. In general, I I have enjoyed the time that I've had with each artist that I've been able to do. And most of the time, it's multiple records, which I think is like more than what most producers can say these days. So, yeah, uh, Attila is another one that comes to mind. I mean, we're all just great friends. And and I also know hard feelings. Like as soon as a band is like, yeah, let's go work with somebody else. I'm like, cool. I I get it. You know, I, I can't do the same thing for 10 years in a row either you know so well man uh like so like whenever everything went down there there were a few projects that you've uh been on that i didn't even know about and like that's like uh the punk goes series yeah like i had no idea about that and i saw that and i'm like dude those were like my shit back in the day (laughs) and um yeah but dude that's awesome that you you were able to you know keep business as business but also keep them friendships and you know there's some people out there that if they would have been in the same situation might have been pissed off like yo I've, I've been doing this for you forever like blah 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 like that's super dope that you were able to keep those friendships like kind of tied together yeah i think it could have been rough if i didn't have anything else going on but the reality was that there were so many clients and so many projects that it was kind of it really just like kept flowing you know as soon as one band left the nest like another one came in and and we were busy constantly i mean i never had time off and and you know i i put together a lot of records i've done over a hundred in my my lifetime so far um and i have a few gold records as well which is nice so i can't complain man I'm, i'm i'm in a good spot so um 
I did a little bit extra research into you. And um, did you see yourself as being like a producer, sound engineer? Or like, were you kind of just doing it to like help out the band you were in at the time? Yeah, I, I, it's not something that I like actually pursued aggressively, right? Like it wasn't something that I set out to be like, all right, I'm going to be this great producer. It kind of just happened. But it would also be wrong of me to say like that I, you know, didn't care about it the whole time. Like as soon as I realized that people wanted me to do what I was doing, I, I got into it. Right. Like I started to be like, Oh, this is a thing that I'm good at. And people like me doing this. So I'm going to get better and better and better at it. In fact, like a lot of my motivation really was to try and continuously impress my clients over and over and over again. So they would come in, right. We would make an album. And then like when they'd start talking to me about like potentially doing a second album, I would start dropping like little hints like, oh, I just got this brand new string library and it sounds super realistic. Like the cellos sound like it's a real cello player. And like I would drop little things like that to like be like, you should come back because I'm just getting better. I'm getting better. And uh, and that seemed to work pretty well for like a long time long, long time. Like I I was, I was leveling up as well. You know, I was getting better. I, uh, as soon as I moved out of that garage, which is where I did like pretty much everything up to plagues. So even half, even half of plagues was recorded at the garage, but the other half was recorded at my new house that I had at the time. And when I moved into that house, it fucking changed the game, bro. Like that's when I got brand new monitors so I could actually hear what the fuck I was doing for the first time. I had, uh, I upgraded my software, upgraded my computer, bought some new gear, had more space to work in. And that whole situation, like just opened the doors, opened the floodgates for, uh, growth. And, um, I had a place for the bands to sleep. I had a place for the bands to eat to, I mean, we did in the first, uh, studio that we worked out of, we didn't have a bathroom. People would just literally go outside and pee on the side of the the garage (laughs) And if they had to take a dump, like they'd have to drive to the gas station, you know, it was pretty fucked up, but we made it work and nobody seemed to really care. But when it started to become a problem, that's when I was like, all right, we got to like, we got to get a house and we got to like figure out how to do this a little more professionally. But even then, when I had the the studio in the house, I'll never forget the day that uh, Sumerian signed Asking Alexandria and Asking's at my house and we're recording the first LP. And Sumerian wants to like fly in. And I'm thinking to myself, these guys do not know what this is like over here. Like there, there's these big shots from LA like coming in and they're like, you know, they, they're flying into Indianapolis. They don't realize that it's a, <laughs> from that airport to my house is like a 90 minute drive. <laughs> You're going into the middle of the cornfields. There's fucking nothing to do. There's fucking nowhere to go. There's nothing to eat. Like it was, it was, I was just like, you guys shouldn't come here. Like, there's no point, but they did come and they were just like, you know, they were like just standing in my house, like looking around, like, this is where the record's being made. This is crazy. And, you know, but I would play back, like I was playing back the tracks for them and stuff. And they were like, oh shit, like, this is really good. So I don't know, man. It was just, I made the best of my situation. I made it work. And, um, what can I say? I I had a good time. (laughs) Dude. (laughs) I felt that whole like being in the middle of uh, nowhere because uh, I'm raised, you know, to live my whole life in West Virginia. I'm like 90 minutes from the closest international airport, um, two hours out of D.C., two hours out of Baltimore. And uh, I remember probably two years ago, uh, had had a, a EDM artist come on from up in Philadelphia And he's like, yeah, man, I'll drive down to you. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Great, whatever. And and, um, he calls me 30 minutes away from the house. He's like, dude, where in the fuck are you bringing me? (laughs) Like, I I remember plain as day. And, you know, to me, you know, to me, living in West Virginia, living here my whole life, you know, driving 30 minutes out of town to get to like, you know, someone's house isn't nothing. But then people that aren't used to being in the middle of BFE driving 30 minutes out of town, you feel like you went on a huge adventure. Yeah. I mean, we were used to, uh, 
45 minute drives to go to a restaurant because we we live to the next to this town called Richmond is 45 minutes away on the freeway. So, you know, you're actually going like quite a few miles away because uh, you're going like 70 miles an hour at 45 minutes. So that's pretty far. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like, and then I moved to Michigan, like, what was that, like 12 years ago or something? And yeah, this is a big state. Like, there's a lot of driving involved. If you drive like from the bottom of Michigan to the very top, it takes nine hours. It's insane. Yeah. Um, I used to work for a company that was uh, out of Angola, Indiana. So I spent a lot of time in like Coldwater, Michigan, uh, Battle Creek, Hillsdale. Yeah. So like that lower, like Southeast corner of Michigan and like Northeast corner of Indiana, I, like I'm very familiar with that area. Yeah. And dude, I remember I was like, man, it can't be that long of a drive to like the UP. And then my buddy's like, nah, dude, it sucks. And I'm like, nah, man, it can't be that bad. It doesn't look that far on the map. And then I oh, made it's... the drive and I was like, what did I get myself into? Oh, yeah. And then there's no way back other than to just drive again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, for aspiring DIY bands, is there like five quick tips you could give them for like helping their recording sound better? Yeah. Um, I would focus a lot on your arrangement. We we have this term that we use or, or this phrase that we use in the industry, which is like a good song is, is an easy mix. And basically all that means is like, if you've planned out your song to basically mix itself, right? Like, Maybe it's uh, like I'll make a I'm just going to make a shitty example so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. But like maybe it's something as simple as like getting your clean tone a little bit quieter than you think it should be and getting your chorus tone a little bit louder than maybe you think it should be and switching to those tones between verse and chorus. And then like making sure that the chords that you play don't really step on the toes of the vocalist and the chords that you play don't double up on the notes that the bass is going to play things like this, uh, you're going to have a song that's way easier to mix than like 99% of what music is because the arrangement is so much more important than the tools and the EQ and the compressors and the blah, 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 blah. Because all that stuff is just made to enhance what's already there. But if what's already there is a mess and it's all jumbled up, then the mixing engineer has to almost do like gymnastics to make it all work and make it sound like it works together. So tip number one is like, check your arrangement, man. Like make it super dead simple to where you can like every part just works as if, if all you could do is just play the song as is, and you couldn't control EQ and you couldn't add compression, make it sound good. Like just from the songwriting perspective, right? The second tip I would say is like, know your vocal parts. Uh, don't write in the studio. I don't know what, who started that and why that's supposed to be a thing, but it's not, don't do it. Just write the song before you ever intend to try and record it. Those are two separate processes and they actually even use two different parts of your brain. So if you're trying to use like both parts of your brain at the same time, kind of doesn't really work out. Um, my third tip would be learn how to play your song to a click if you don't want to record to a click, I totally understand like the vibe and that whole thing, but it's better to a click. If you can put it to a click, you can, you can make sure that the, the production is really solid. Uh, fourth tip, um, make sure that you have solid instruments, good strings, good drum heads, uh, all that stuff is a huge makes a huge, huge, huge difference um, in the recording process. Fifth tip would be maybe just practice the song a couple of times. You know, like there's sometimes where I record a song or produce a song and there's like the like the people have never played it before. Believe that or not. So, you know, it'd be nice if you could just already play the song before you come in. <laughs> I. I feel like that is something that 
you know, outside looking in, being a fan of music, um, I feel like that's something that happens more often than not as like bands possibly like especially local, you know, small DIY bands like their first time playing through could sometimes be the day they they decide to record it or that song wasn't planned to be recorded. And then they're like, you know what? We're feeling the vibe of this song over this song. Well, I want to add like a caveat to what I just said, though, because like I just because I was just actually on a call with someone and we were talking about the same subject. And the subject was, how are you going to condense like a year and a half to two years worth of written material and record it in a period of 15 days? That's insane. And one of my sort of rules has always been like, if you can afford to do this and you have your own ability to like record yourself in your own space with your own microphone and all this stuff and do it like as the ideas happen, you're going to have so much better material emotionally and, and even sonically, it's going to be better because you did it in the moment where you were excited about the idea or you were feeling the the pain or you were feeling the the moment and um every band wants to believe that there's like this thing where you just you write a bunch of songs and you go in the studio and then you record a bunch of songs and then that's no more because we have technology everybody's got computers everybody's got plugins and software and microphones and whatever so there's really kind of no excuse to not be able to like actually kind of pre-record your album as you're writing it and I think it actually ends up turning into a way better album. And one perfect example of this is my buddy's Tyler Smith, who was in Danger Kids. And now, now he's like a you know a pretty prolific producer and doing like Falling in Reverse and I Prevail. Uh, but it, he was in Danger Kids and he, he so desperately wanted me to basically produce his album. And I was like, I would love to produce your album. In fact, I, I'm kind of sad that I'm not going to get to because my advice to you is to have you do it. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? And I was like, dude, all the late nights that you're going to be in your apartment up until three in the morning doing that vocal part just the way that you want it is something that you can't have any other way. You're not going to be able to come to the studio and bash this out in 10 days. You're not going to, we're not going to be able to record it in 10 days, edit it in 10 days and mix it in 10 days, right? Like it's not going to come out the same. Like if you sat there in your room in your studio for the next year, bashing out every song as they come as you feel it bring that to the table to the mixing table it's going to be like ten thousand times better so my sort of public uh what was that called a psa public service announcement is like please just get a pretty decent microphone and just record your shit as it happens because it'll be way better <laughs> Um, what is your preferred microphone for, say, doing vocals? I'll, I'll tell you, it's not really my preferred microphone, but it, it's a really solid choice because it gives you a little more flexibility than other microphones because you have the ability to go back and change the models and stuff, but it's called the VMS. It's basically the Stephen Slate virtual microphone system. And it's kind of like a, it's... It's not super expensive. I want to say it probably goes on the market for like 700 bucks right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but once you set it up, what what's cool about it is that it's supposed to have like this flat response where it just like records pretty flat. And then you have this software that goes along with it. Um, there's also a preamp that comes with it too. And when you use the software on the mic, you can actually change what the mic model is and the reason why that works is because the original recording that you that you're doing through the mic is like basically flat and and ready to be molded if you will. Cuz a lot of microphones out there have like a curve to them. They have like an EQ curve, they have a dynamic response, they have a harmonic saturation response, etc like that. And uh once you've recorded that, you can't undo that. You can't remove that EQ curve. You can't take that saturation back out, etc. Right. So he tried to make a microphone that didn't add anything. And then when you're in the software, you can then add it to you can change it to be a different model. You can add uh different levels of intensity of that model, etc. So I recommend that microphone as a safe bet because if you're a band that wants to be able to record on the fly as the ideas come to you, 
you can go to a producer who has the same microphone system, or even if they don't have the microphone system, but they they can download the software, they'll have the ability to change what the microphone sounds like after you recorded it, which is really cool. Now, what is one piece of affordable, like bang for your buck studio gear you would recommend to an aspiring mix engineer? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, bang for your buck. Most of the, I I would say the most important thing is monitoring. The more and more I look at it and the more I think about it, it's, it's kind of the reason why one, like, like if there's two people, let's say one person is doing really well and the other person is not doing so well, like they're struggling with their mixes you know, they're struggling to get clients. The difference is typically the monitoring because if you don't, if the monitoring is not good, your decision-making sucks. Like you're not able to figure out what to do with the low end. You're not able to figure out if your guitars are too loud or if your vocals are too loud because you can't fucking hear it. And um, there's a lot of different products that attempt to solve this problem. Uh, you know, there's like the sonar works. Um, there's the VSX system. But I like to just say, you know, get good, get good at mixing on good old fashioned monitors, get good at mixing on headphones and get good at also referencing like reference, reference, reference. If you're just mixing your song, you're not referencing anything else. You're fucking up like you should be totally listening to other stuff that's already done, trying to get as close as you can to like. Uh, competitive space and then also taking your own mixes into other devices like going into your car uh, listening to it on your iphone listening to it on your earbuds and your airpods whatever you got because the more things that you hear your mix through the more information that you have to make decisions dude you just answered my very next question i was about to ask you (laughs) all in that that is great it's like you were reading my mind. <laughs> um, now that you have like your own plugins, mixing academy, and a successful you and successful YouTube channels, do you still mix records regularly, or have you like outsourced a lot of that work to other engineers? Well, I'm really fortunate to have an engineer that I've been working with for over ten years now. His name is Nick Matzkos. Uh, I basically taught him everything that I know. And uh, I've also taught him my very specific method for how I create music production and how I approach mixing. And we've uh, we've been iterating on um, a mixing template that we've been building for years that is kind of, for lack of a better word, it's kind of agnostic. It's like basically built around physics and the idea that there's only so much room where your, your audio can go. And so there's only so much space for everything to share. And based on those principles, we've built like a mixing template that allows us to kind of like mix and mold, like anything that we want into the space and have it work pretty well, if that makes sense. So like mixing is not like a big to do for us. It's, more like just a part of the process it's another step that's that's added to the production process that we have to go through but it's not like we have to sit down and go okay how am i going to mix this because like we kind of already know how we're going to mix it it's just a matter of like putting all the things into the right slots so that it all comes together um and i talk a lot about that on my nail the mix sessions that i have over at urm at the last two that I did, which one was with Conquer Divide and um, Attack Attack, and the most recent one, which was with Oceano. And between those two sessions, if you look at what we're doing, you can see what I'm talking about. It's basically just like a, it's kind of like auto mix based. It, it, like I say that term very loosely. Like I don't want people to think that I just put your audio into a, a machine and it mixes it that's not what's happening um but it's a lot easier than the standard traditional way of mixing like 
we're not spending a ton of time going in and dialing in EQ or dialing in compressors. We actually have all that stuff already dialed in. If you think about it, it's the digital way of how CLA mixes. Like if you look at how CLA mixes, he's got a uh, like a huge wall or a rack of gear behind him, right? But those knobs like never move. They're all set like a specific way. And then the way that he mixes is he just pushes the audio into those things. Like you can push it hard or you can push it medium or you can push it soft in a way that you push things into the, into the rest of the hardware, it comes back out a little bit differently. And then it all blends into a couple of other summing compressors or summing mixers that then in, end up creating your mix. And uh, that's exactly what we do, but we just do it in a digital format rather than the hardware format. All right, I got one more question about mixing, and then I want to ask you a couple questions about uh, JST, URM, and your other business that I keep fucking blanking on. It makes me feel like a dumbass because I had it down, and then you were the one that had to finish it earlier. But um, if you had to choose five plugins only to mix an ins- entire song with, what would they be? Five plugins only. I need an EQ. I need a compressor. I need some kind of distortion. I need reverb and I need a limiter. So let's get specific EQ. I'll use my own EQ, which is the JST EQ. Um, If I could only pick one compressor, I probably wouldn't pick any of my own compressors because they're very specific. So I would probably pick like a Swiss army knife compressor, maybe like an, like an API compressor or something, something that you can do a lot of different crazy shit with. For the distortion, I would probably, this is going to make people mad, but dude, just the stock distortion in Cubase. It's great. I don't fucking know what you want from me. It's good. (laughs) (laughs) What do you want me to say? Like fab filter or something? I don't know. I don't use it. So um, reverb, I would say... uh, I kind of, I actually, I'm kind of really digging that slate verb. Uh, what's it called? Something classics, verb suite classics or something like that. I can't remember the name of it, but I know where it is in the screen. Um, and then a limiter. God, you have to have such a good limiter. Um, I'm, I want to, I want to switch out the limiter for something else, actually. I think I want to switch the limiter out for a multi band compressor because that, saves my ass like a million times over because the multiband compressor is kind of like having the ability to not only enhance and and punch things up but also to like control eq automatically like if you have like if you have a source that's got like a wild amount of like 200 hertz but you don't want to completely nuke it with eq you can use a linear multi-band uh multi-band compressor or just a multi-band compressor in general uh to help you combat that automatically so that when it does bloom it punches it down and when it's not blooming it just doesn't touch it which is a lot different than just sucking it out with eq real quick before we continue uh do you want me to turn on a light because i know the sun's going down and starting to get dark on my camera Oh no, man! You're fine. If if you want to turn on a light, you can. If Let me you... do that real quick. All right. You're gonna have two two different looks now. Hey, now um, my next question I want to ask is about Drum Forge, because okay. where where was you're like thinking with it like why did you like think about like you know what i want to do something that's like strictly for drums well i started off with drums uh like my first product i ever made uh was uh, i created a brand online called joey Sturge's drums and then uh i created a couple products in that area uh we did sub drops we did um I did like a kick and snare kind of thing. I did a contact instrument on and on. Right. And then uh, I kind of graduated to doing more, much more than that, which was to 
start selling like my Joey Sturgis tones, which was like the tones that, you know, that I would create, I'd create tones in different uh, simulators. And uh, I see this post one day on Facebook and it's my, my old buddy, Joel. And I hadn't talked to him in like several years. We, we collaborated on a couple projects as producers, um, but I hadn't talked to him in a while. And he had made this Facebook post and he was like, He's like driving to the studio, getting ready to sample a bunch of drums. And he had like a picture of all this, dr- all these drums and shit. And I was just like, oh my God. Like I, I had so much FOMO, you know, like I was like, I-, I need to be a part of this. I don't know what's going on, but I-, I have to somehow figure this out. So I call him up to get a feel for like what's really going down. And I had assumed that he was going to make a product. And when I talked to him, he was basically like, oh, no, like, we're recording all this shit for ourselves. Like, we're so tired of dealing with shitty drums and all these other drum samples that are out there. Like, we just want to have our own drum samples and just, like, use those for our own productions and our own mixes and stuff. And I was like, bro, do you know how much money I've made from selling drum samples? Because you need to do this. You need to be doing the same thing. We we need to be doing the same thing we need to be selling these drum samples that you're about to make. Um, And then he was a little skeptical because he was kind of like, no, I don't know if I really want like other people to have them and blah, blah, blah. So I kind of just talked him into it. Um, And I sort of assumed the role of like, I'm going to join, we're going to build this company together. I'm going to join you guys. I'm going to help. And we're just going to do drums. And then I was like, well, I'll come in and do symbols because I know how to do symbols really well. And you guys seem to not really understand how that works, but I can do that for you. And then I'll be the manager. I'll build a website. I'll start putting everything together. And so that's kind of how basically we just decided, like, let's start a company together. Let's uh, start s- selling some of these samples. Let's just see where it goes. And the, the amount of drums that they were initially sampling was so massive that in my mind at the time, I felt like we had an infinite business. I was just like, we'll never need to sample drums again. Well, boy, was I wrong. But at the time, it just felt like so much material that we were going to be able to just start a company, sell just those samples, and then just like that would be it. But, you know, time went on and things changed. But that that was kind of the outlook of it is that they had built up this massive set of of stuff that we had to work with. And I was like, we need to put this online and get it out to people because it's going to be a number one. It's going to be amazing tool for people. I mean, this, this guy's drum set collection was like one of one in the world. Like he had some of the craziest drums that we were allowed to have access to in sample. And the second part of it was just like, this is going to be a great business. Like there's going to be a lot of revenue here and, and we're going to help a lot of people and it's going to be like a powerful thing for songwriters to have and a powerful thing for mixing engineers to have. And, you know, so it just kind of was a serendipitous thing that seemed to make sense. Dude, that, that honest, that makes a whole lot of sense. Cause I, I feel like there's times where bands really don't have the best drum set or don't have it set up correctly. And I feel like that, is something that 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 definitely helps out a lot of uh sound engineers and producers like whenever they can like kind of mess with it a little bit or add a little bit of cha-ching in there you know i mean sometimes it's as simple as you know maybe you have like a decent sounding drum recording but it's just not punchy enough well you can use drum samples to make it punchier it's not always about compressors or it's not always about processors it's sometimes about the sounds themselves right or like the other scenario would be like let's say you want your uh you know your drums to sound a certain way but you don't have the drums that you like that you would need to record to be able to make it sound that way or you don't have the space well you can just record a drummer in or in any old room it doesn't even matter i mean i used to do this all the time i record drums in my dining room in the house in indiana and what we would do is we would just high pass the shit out of it at 800 hertz so that there's like literally no low end at all it's just fucking all symbols and shit 
and then layer program drums over top of it and just make those program drums match what the drummer played so that it's exactly the same. And you can get it down to like like micro milliseconds almost so that you, the listener could never tell that you added a, a, like a fake drum to it. And that sounds amazing. Like that, that gives you the ability to kind of do whatever you want. Like you could have, you could record the whole song with a low pitch snare and then add a high pitch snare later. And uh, it wouldn't be weird. Like there, you know, it's, you have the possibility of doing pretty much anything. So we did a lot of that, you know, and it was, it was just a lot of like, sci- like, like record making in a science lab in a sense, you know, you just kind of had the ability to control any parameter <laughs> and, uh, and, and not have any kind of consequences. So that, that was the way that I preferred to make records because, you know, you want to be in the, in the power, in the position of control in a position of power where you can get things done the way that, that you think they should be done to make the record the best that it can be. So that kind of leads into my next question, and uh, I want to ask you about JST. Where was your thinking kind of like on the same lines as like with Drum Forge whenever you decided to do JST, or was there a little bit extra into it? So JST uh, came about because, uh, well, I, I'll give you the sort of the backstory to this. Okay. So in 2006, I started a YouTube channel. Um, that's that was the first year that YouTube became available to people. Like 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. I started a channel. And uh, I really just kind of did it for fun. It was just, there wasn't like any kind of um, intention behind it at all, really. It was just like, oh, this looks cool. You can just like upload videos and people can watch them. That sounds awesome. Let me, uh, let me mess around with that. And so, you know, I went to Walmart, I bought like a $275 like camcorder that, you know, takes little mini DV tapes that you put in there and I would just record stuff in the studio. And then I would at, at the end of the night, you have to play back the footage into the computer. The computer has to record the footage because it's going from an analog tape to a digital format. Then you have to like encode it so that you could actually like edit it and all this crap. And even with all that, I still found time to build like little studio vlogs. And I was uploading studio vlogs in 2007, like before anyone ever even thought of vlogging or (laughs) any of this crap that we see today. And it it was so innocent in, in the time. But what I was thinking in my mind was I was like, the stuff that's happening right now is like historic. Like I'm making a, a record with like the Devil Wars Prada and the Devil Wars Prada is on Rise Records. And like, this is a band on a label making their first or second album. Right. And like, this is like never going to happen again. Like this is, this is a moment in time. I want to capture it. I want to share it with people. But I also felt like, okay, this band is, a big deal there. They have a lot of fans. There's a lot of eyeballs on them. There's a lot of people listening to them. I want to be present in that conversation. I want people to know that I'm a part of this process. I want people to see what I'm doing. I want people to see what kind of impact I have on this process and on these songs. So making the vlogs was like my way of like ensuring that people knew I was a part of the process. I was the one doing it and I had impact on it. And sure enough, that inadvertently built an audience around myself. And I had no idea that that's what I was doing. I was more just thinking like, I just want to make sure that people know like Joey Sturgis did this, you know, like (laughs) that's kind of was my thought thought process. And then so on and on, uh, you know, fast forward through the story, you know, I, I got MySpace, I've got I'm the first person on Twitter. I'm like, you know, one of the first people to have Gmail. Like I, I was always sort of like up into the newest internet thing. What whatever was going on, I was I was creating an account day one and starting to use the the software or the or the app or whatever it is, right? And on Twitter, people would constantly ask me how I was doing stuff because like I would do a record with Prada, it would come out, people would hear it, they'd get excited and they'd be like, How'd you do those guitars? Or they'd hear the vocals they're like what mic did you use 
And with Twitter, like it kind of opened the floodgates for anyone to be able to send you a message because they could just do it publicly by tweeting at you, right? It, it wasn't like you needed to know my email address. You could just type in like Joey Sturgis, find my Twitter account, hit, you know, reply and be like, what microphone did you use? You know, so it was like that easy to have a conversation with somebody. So because of that, the demand for all the information from me got intense. I mean, I was getting, you know, five, seven, sometimes eight questions a day of like the same thing, like eight questions a day of somebody saying, what are you using for guitar tones? How'd you build that guitar tone? What EQ do you do on your guitar tone? Like, you know, like that. And I'm like, I think there's a better way to answer these questions. Cause like I could reply to each tweet or I could just tweet it out into the universe. Or what if I just like share my tones? What if I like create the tone, upload it on a website, make it easy to download? What if I just charge like a little bit of money for it? You know what? Like it's kind of the same thing as a drum sample, I guess. Right. So I just fl flirted around with that idea and, uh, and I released my first tone and then, you know, we did really well and then just kept, I kind of kept going on that wave. And that's how, that is how JST began is that it was 100% a guitar tone website where you buy, you buy and download guitar tones. That's all it was. Then I started to get a little bit smarter. I started to think I have a lot of people going to this website and they're not going to my drums. They're not going to my drum store website. So let me take those drums and put them over here in the site where everyone's going. And a little more of that, a little co-mingling. And then I'm finally like, all right, let me shut down the drum store. I'll just have Joyster's tones. It'll be like all that stuff. And then I, that's when I started to dabble with plugins. And then I created the first plugin, um, which took a lot of time right but i created that first plugin and i uploaded it on the site and i didn't know what was going to happen because i was kind of like you know people are used to buying like things from me that that are really easy to use like you just download the the sample pack and then they're just wave files like there's nothing to explain you just have wave files and you use them or you have my little guitar tone and you just open the preset manager and you open the tone and there it is but the plugin's a whole different thing. It's like you have to install it on your computer and then it has to, you have to pull it up in your DAW. Like, so I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but um, I launched it. It did really well. And after that first plugin that came out with that first week of sales, my life changed forever because that's when I, I used to live in this little cul-de-sac and uh, outside of the cul-de-sac was this bank. And uh, after that first week of sales, I got my car, I drove out of the cul-de-sac into the bank parking lot, walked into there, into the office, slapped down a big old report of how much money I had made last week. And I was like, I want to buy a house. And then I got approved. I bought a house. I moved to Michigan. And it just changed my life. From there, I became financially independent, able to do do whatever I wanted whenever I wanted. And I, and from there I started to build the company, start to focus on new plugins, start to focus on taking the next steps to take JST to the next level. But it was really that first plugin backed by all the other stuff that had happened leading up to it, right? Like all the tones, all the sample packs, all the production work and that first plugin, all of that played into being able to show that on paper, I wasn't this self-employed like risk anymore. Like I was a guy that was able to actually create uh, a living out of what I was doing and not have to be an employee of a company to be able to go and buy a house. And so that was a big deal. Now with JST, do you have anything that's getting ready to drop or anything that you can talk about that might be a little bit new? Absolutely. Um, if you've been paying attention to JST lately, you've probably seen, you know, we've dropped a couple new things. We had a JST maximizer come out. We had the, uh, the melodic spark sample pack come out. We've been dropping tons of updates to our plugins. We've been uh, making everything M1 compatible with the Apple Silicon. 
But this next thing is a big deal. Uh, this next plugin that's about to come out, it's a new Tone Forge plugin. And it's not your typical, like, oh, we, you know, we found a guitar player and we made a Tone Forge plugin with them. I mean, it's a little bit of that, but it's a whole new era of technology for us because we we really kind of was like, there's too much similar technology out there. There's too many people doing the same kind of thing in terms of how you're creating the tone. Um, and I can get into some technical terms like, you know, white box modeling, things like this. And we decided to like kind of go in a different direction. Like obviously we're going to have some white box modeling in there, which is modeling of the analog circuits in a virtual world. And we're doing that because it sounds good and it's good. And we're still doing some of that, but we're going to introduce a couple of new technologies into this next plugin that allow you to finally basically achieve the tones that you hear like in the marketing like the the argument is often okay i watched the video the song is amazing the tone sounds awesome but when i plug my guitar in and i open the plugin it doesn't sound like that why and the answer is because your guitar is different. Your pickups are different. Your preamp is different. Your cable is different. Your computer is different. Everything's different. The only thing that's the same is the software. So how do you bridge the gap between all the variables outside of your computer that we can't control because that's your stuff that you're bringing to the table? How do we control that to get it to work with the, the get the eventual result of the tone that you heard in the video or the tone that you hear on the website? We've come up with something that actually makes that possible. Um, and we've also come up with some other different technologies inside the plugin in terms of how we're generating the tone using AI, using neural networks, using this latest uh, machine learning technology to be able to get as close as possible with the DSP uh, to create those tones that you that that people want to have in in the box. It's a uh, incredibly exhaustive process. Uh, it took us two years to get to this place. Um, it was also additionally uh, complicated because of the pandemic. But we did it, and uh, I feel really confident about the direction that this is going to go. And um, I'm excited to share it with people. And I think people are, people should be really excited because it's it's a whole new way of approaching this this problem of guitar tone in the computer and uh i i'm just massively excited for it so just keep an eye out on our instagram that's the first place that we're going to announce it dude i will definitely be keeping an eye out cuz i dude music has been my life since i can remember you know I remember being 10 years old, like fourth, fifth grade. First album I ever got was uh, Subliminal Verses. Oh, nice. Slipknot. And um, just from there on, like my life has just like been music, 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 music as a fan. I've tried playing instruments. I, I, I don't know what it is about me, but I can't touch them. Mm -mm, that, that ain't my thing. But I enjoy music. I love the passion. I love everything that involves it you know the behind the scenes stuff you know the producing of it um the blood sweat and tears that go into getting a song just perfect or the countless nights of recording 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 until you get it just to where you want it like that right there like the type of dedication that a lot of these bands and artists put into their stuff you can feel it and just about all their music. And I just love it. It's now, awesome. Now I got one more question for you. It's it it's a little it's it's a little bit out it's it's outside of music, you know. But whenever you aren't around music or you know, you just need to decompress, do you have any hobbies that you enjoy doing? I got two main things that keep me sane when uh, I need to step away from music. One is uh, I'm, I'm actually really into mixology. 
Um, I've never been in like a bartender anywhere or anything. So that is, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking more about like, you know, just uh, decompressing over the, uh, like, like just you finished your day of work and, and you sit down and you're like, okay, I could either drink a pre-made drink, which is like a, you know, a, a beer that's all, you know, you just open it and you drink it or some wine, or I can play with all these different flavors and these different tools and like build my own cocktail and I can experiment with that. And it really came from the pandemic, uh, just not being able to like go out to a cocktail bar or anything like that. So I started to like flirt with it. Like I would buy some stuff. I would like watch some videos, buy some stuff, mess around with it. And now I'm, I'm like down a super deep, deep, deep hole. Like I'm making my own bitters. I'm making my own gin. Like I, <laughs> I'm doing crazy science experiments, like just beyond my camera right now. I'm looking at like, you know, a bunch of science experiments and stuff. Um, but I'm really into the mixology is one of those things. And I've, I think I've made a perfect old fashioned that I feel very strong about. Um, that's going to probably be like my first drink, I guess. And then, uh, the second thing that I spend a lot of time doing is typically only in the summertime is boating. Uh, I love to go out on the water, uh, just spend a day out on the water with friends, take some friends with you, jump on the boat go out somewhere, anchor, jump in the water, you know, have a good time. Let's crank up some tunes, have a couple of drinks. That's, that's my thing. And I like taking, taking care of the boats. Um, you know, taking care of a boat is, uh, is a, it's hard work and it's challenging. And I, I think that's a good thing for me. Um, otherwise I would, I'd have it too easy. You know, I, I, I like to have something that's a little, that re- requires a little bit of work and a little bit of, puts you in a little bit of place of frustration here and there, you know, you're like your, your water pump goes out and you're like, what the heck is going on? And then you got to troubleshoot it and then you got to rip it out of there and install a new one. It, I don't know, it keeps you on your toes. It's kind of nice. So I, I like, I like those two things. Dude, I love mixology. I've been uh, trying to find like decent bidders in stores because i don't want to like go online and pay for shipping and handling right now yeah. and like it's all like i don't know where to look for bidders like store wise because like yeah. all i want to do is make old fashions like i had one whenever my wife and i were on our honeymoon and it was the greatest thing i ever drank in my life because i've always been a beer man beer's yeah. been my go-to thing mm. um so like mixology is something that's always interested me like especially like there's a couple speakeasies around where we live at that I know of, I've been to like one or two of them, and some of the wild cocktails that those like uh, mixologists come up with just blow my blow my mind. Yeah, I mean, then, I'm I'm into that stuff, man. I I, I spend uh, time, you know, I make my own syrups. So, like, if you have an old fashioned, let's say, and it's it's with like a demerara syrup or something, like I'll I'll actually make that syrup myself rather than buy it online. Um, you know. Uh, I'm making my own bitters. So like, instead of going to the store, getting the Angostura bitters, which is like the most widely used bitters of all time. Um, I can't make that because it's a secret recipe, but I can make my own. Like I make all kinds of, you know, I make a, a blueberry black tea bitters. I make like a, 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 a clove blood red, a blood orange, um, with vanilla and, and some little, uh, smoky flavors in there. You know, I make a orange bitters, like, all this stuff is actually stuff you can make. It just takes time. Like it, it takes about uh, two weeks to make a bitters because you have to let it infuse. It's called cold infusion. So basically just put a bunch of ingredients, mix it with uh 151. And the 151 is, is what actually pulls the flavors out of the ingredients that are in there. And then you just strain it. And then whatever's left, you put like a tablespoon of, of uh, sugar in there mix it all up and there's your bitters and uh yeah it's it's a lot of fun actually i like i like to do it all right um for anyone who possibly might not know who you are that's like man i really enjoyed this he told a lot of awesome stuff where can they find you at these days i spend most of my time on instagram um and i'm i'm totally approachable like you can just dm me i i i'll check all my dms 
Uh, it's Joey is music with a K at the end. So uh, J O E Y I S M U S I C K. Um, and then all, and then uh, what's your websites if people want to check out your tones and drums and your uh, URM Academy? Yeah, so you can check out uh, Joey Sturgis Tones at joeysturgistones.com, uh, drumforge.com for all the drum stuff we do. And then we also have Nail the Mix, which is just nailthemix.com, or uh, you could go to urm.academy. That's a weird website. It doesn't have a .com. It's just urm.academy. Um, but, yeah, that's all the stuff that we do, essentially. And um, it's fun. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff within our ecosphere of like everything that we make, like you could potentially make your own album from scratch. Like, you know, like you, you go to URM and learn about how that works. And then you get some plugins from Joy Sturgis Tones, you get some drum samples from drum forge. And it's like, you're kind of halfway there at that point, you know? <laughs> so that's kind of like our goal is to just kind of empower music creators of all kinds. We know that there's, you know, any, combination of the of all the things right there's guitar players that want to learn how to mix there's mixers who want to learn how to play guitar we we also have another site called riff hard where we teach uh people how to play guitar um uh, right now we actually have jason richardson on this month at riff riffhard.com so for those of you that are a fan of of jason or all that remains or even just metal guitar in general go go to riffhard.com check that out because you know it's 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 kind of like Netflix for metal guitar playing, if that makes sense. You just log in and there's just tons of everything that you need to know about how to play guitar. Like, you know, we focus a lot on actually uh, rhythm guitar playing because a lot of guitar sites focus on like soloing and stuff. But the thing that's funny is like, go watch a band and go watch them play a guitar solo with no rhythm underneath. It's like rhythm is actually the most important guitar playing uh and doing it well is not easy like we teach like the whole down picking strategy and all this different stuff so that that's another cool thing to check out but yeah that's the stuff dude thank you so much for coming on and uh giving us your time this evening thank um, you. hope to do it again i really enjoy my time still semi freaking out on the inside but we made it through <laughs> um but listen thank you everyone for tuning in if you don't know where to find us you can find us on all socials at the wilson king podcast you can check out our website at the wilson king podcast.com we got a little merch store up there if you want to go check that out just go click that store button and depending on where you're listening to us at or if you just found us randomly on the on our website because you just scrolled across it, you can also listen to us on all major streaming platforms. Hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Be safe. Be responsible. Don't drink and drive. Peace.